At all times, tracks, trail and highways served humanity as keys to evolution. Empires and civilizations disappeared, centuries old dust swept capitals and cities. But roads kept bringing new people here. Do we know how roads revitalized areas hundreds of years ago and how they changed people's destinies today? We go on the Treasures of the Nation expedition to reveal facts about life at the crossroads of antiquity. Modern motorways are very much new, but if a trail is left, it will surely be found even thousands of years later. In this episode, where did they domesticate horse for the first time? How did horse domestication change the world? And who built the first chariot? Common cars, commuter buses and fixed route taxi buses. Using them you can get from point A to point B. The roads are there and movement in space does not disturb our consciousness and the way we see things. But it's hard to imagine what this world looked like without stallions used as major vehicle, not to mention the usual iron horses and wheel transportation means. Our civilization was created on the back of the horse. Without it, everything in the world around us, including wars, would be different. To find out how our horse civilization appeared and progressed, the treasures of the nation expedition will follow the traces of the first horse riders. Join us and you will not regret it. This scientific fact has already gone around the whole world. For the first time, horse domestication occurred in Kazakhstan. In other words, the horse was tamed and it happened on the territory of Botai, an Neolithic settlement, which is exactly where we are heading. If those who claim that the civilization started with the horse are right, then our filming crew will soon face an exciting encounter with the source of the modern meta. Dreams do come true. At last, I'm at the excavation of Botai settlement. The archaeologist Aman Magzumov will tell us about what's going on here. So is this Bortai, the Bortai settlements or what? Maybe burials? Exactly, this is the Bortai Neolithic settlement. It is unique because this is exactly the place on the territory of Kazakhstan where for the first time they domesticated the horse. Could you tell us about the local finds? In this part of the settlement, in the dwellings, we find a lot of leather crafting tools for processing animal skins and leather. We can allege that local residents worked with skins and leather during winter, when they spent a lot of time in their dwellings. They would take their time to prepare some raw materials for spring. In vitro, we can say so, yes. During the winter period, they had a lot of free time and would work with skins and bones. I heard that they find dozens or even hundreds of thousands of animal bones here in Botai. A remarkable fact is that among all the bones that we find in the area, 99.9% .9 are horse bones. This means that the overwhelming majority of the bone material that they processed belonged to horses. The Botai residents were the real masters of processing horse skins and bones. They did it skillfully, in large quantities and in a flow-line production manner. What other evidence is there that the Botai people pioneered horse domestication. What artifacts can an archaeologist use as a proof that they really tamed the horse exactly here? Today in reindeer breeding they use the so-called veterinary scalpels. They are called botsumena and look like this. We also find them here. Okay, what else? These, for example, are the so-called painless horse locks or ham shackles. We found some remains of these bone devices here. Ham shackles? Yes, for front legs, the so-called two-foot horse locks. They look exactly the same as the ones used by modern horse breeders in Kazakhstan. Some three-leg ham shackles also. So we find all these things here in Botai. In addition to saddling the horse, Botai residents created a unique dome architecture, invented trousers, hair ropes and perhaps all other horse rider ammunition, boots and the Malakai headpiece. The first riders already had the weaving loom and produced fabric from nettle and hemp. Nevertheless, horse breeding was their most important craft. 
Bontai people traded horses. Other tribes would hire them to tame horses and take care of them. In other words, they were professional horse breeders. This is when cultivation of different horse breeds began. They would interbreed and hybridize different breeds with each other and among themselves, as well as used wild horse breeds for crossing. They would take horses from adjacent areas, that is, horses that occurred on the territory of present-day Kazakhstan. Professor Zybert believes that human life changed dramatically after the moment of settling the horse. First of all, the speed of information exchange sharply increased. The concept and norms of life became different. New settlements and new communication links emerged. The need for forms of active interaction, trade and wars gained momentum. The family structure also changed. The man received the status of the patriarch. All that happened because of the horse. In fact, Botai people launched the new era of horse-based transportation and communication which proceeds to this day. Indeed, it is still proceeding just in new forms. Horse-based transportation era, then steam-driven mechanisms, then the planes, space travel and finally the Internet. These are the three, four main phases. But all these phenomena are very much recent, whereas the horse has been helping us for 6,000 years. Right, almost till today, although the purpose, value and priorities changed over time. The horse still maintains its role because it connected and still connects us with the nature. Previously this bond was very strong and almost magic. We can say it was sacral. Sacral means divine. It would be great to learn what is at the core of this divine secret of connection between human and horse. They say what the man has done, the man can do. The new destination of our expedition is Kostanai. There in the city suburbs day by day, a group of experts is involved in host selection. Welcome. So this is the place where they produce the famous Kazakh Kostanai horse breed, isn't it? Indeed, this is the place. We have been breeding and developing the Kazakh Kostanai breed, the famous saddle horse, for many years now. Our horse breeding center has been operating for 129 years. Next year we will be celebrating our 130th anniversary. The history of the city of Kostanai itself is closely linked with horses. In 1888, according to the Emperor's decree, the first horse breeding center was established here. To launch it, they carefully selected 300 mares and 30 seed stallions. The center's task was to breed a universal breed that would be quick, hardy and tall. A lot of money was invested into the operation. Gradually, the required infrastructure and a whole city grew around the breeding center. All this was done in order to develop a new stud breed. The Kostanai breed is different from other breeds because it is universal. It competes with all other breeds around the world by all parameters. It even made it to the Guinness Book of Records. In 1959, the stallion Chervonets, or 10 ruble coin in Russian, ran 100 kilometers in 4 hours 2 minutes. This record is still valid and wasn't beaten by any other breed in the world. So they are capable of covering long distances in a short time long and short distances. They run really smoothly and fast. Let's say during the last 10 years the Kostanai breed got 359 victories. Okay, but what evidence is there proving the cultural connection of people with horses? What Kazakh traditions are there related to the horse? The whole life of a Kazakh is connected with horses. The Kazakh women have a special affectionate name, Kulin, that they call their children, which means my little foal or colt. When children were three to five years old, the Kazakhs used to already put them in a special saddle, Ashimai. It appears in the Kazakh language about 30% of set expressions are related to various terms related to horses. There are multiple musical Dombra compositions or cues devoted to horse. When playing Dombra, there is even a special sequence of sounds representing hooves clatter. So we can say that the whole history of the Kazakh nation has been written for the clatter of horse hooves. Tulpa Tuyagumen Jazilgan Tarik DD. Describing the Kazakhs, they even say Mnezim Zhilkanim Nezim, which means we are the people with horse character, the Tulpa character. 
In the course of conversation, Nabidallah Akanovich invited our team to visit an amazing place. All the guests of the horse breeding plant go there. It is the cemetery of honor where the most honorable Kostanai breed horses are buried. Our ancestors, the Samartians and the Saki, our nomadic ancestors, had great respect towards horses and even organized special burials of honor for them. We are keeping this tradition and bury our best horses here. Great idea and thank you very much for such an attitude towards horses. This is how it is supposed to be. Rasul Gamzatov once said, I may jig it, so please don't come into my house without praising the horse. Having collected some evidence that the horse was really domesticated in Botai and having paid tribute to the modern descendants of the ancient Botai breed, the filming crew decided to learn whether another great discovery took place in this step. We are talking about the invention of the chariot. Our journey along the ancient horse routes has brought our group to Petropavlovsk. Archaeologist Anatoly Pleshakov has been studying the traces of ancient cultures for a long time and has witnessed multiple finds dating back to different eras. One of the most interesting discoveries of Petrine cultures still inspiring him. Then continuing the digging of the barrows, we found some chariots. And here we are talking about the beginning of the second millennium BC, which is basically 4,000 years ago. 4,000! Exactly. And it turns out that already at that time they had chariots and soldiers driving them. The fascinating thing is that in some burials we discovered soldiers or chariot drivers together with chariots. Can we say that the cult of chariot drivers existed at that time? It's hard to imagine what the outlook of those people was. Well, they would bury the chariot drivers together with chariots and together with horses. Can you imagine the size of a burial pit so that it could fit all this? They are huge, large barrows and huge chambers. The Beckenese and Berlik barrows, for example, and the Petrine culture are exactly the case. The settlement of Akaim, without any shadow of doubt, represents the culmination of the Bronze Age in the Great Steppe. It could be called the residence of ancient chariot drivers. The open wings of the first horsemen had brought them here to the present-day Chelabinsk region of the Russian Federation. 4,000 years later, we follow the roads that were laid by these cavalry men. What are the key achievements, so to say, results of the Akaim culture? First of all, the chariot, the most ancient chariots known to science today. The classical two-horse chariots or double-horse teams, like cars and spider wheels as we know them, belong exactly to this culture. They used all of them. They were the first ones in the world? Yes. The first or the earliest registered chariots in the world were found exactly here, in the steppe of northern Kazakhstan and southern Urals. The creation of the chariot is closely related to the steppe tradition of horse breeding and the linkage between men and horses evident in the steppe culture. To clarify, science does know about more ancient chariots or carts, but they were driven by oxen or bulls and represented rather heavy and slow vehicles with massive wheels. This is what the Sintashti chariot looked like, a military equipment innovation of the Bronze Age. And it was exactly it that made the Akaim people so powerful and allowed them to pave the bronze roads across the whole great stamp. It is worthy of note that a chariot is not the physical object itself. It's the military art, mythology and corresponding rituals. For many ancient peoples, the chariot was a powerful image connected with heavenly gods. It is associated with an extensive global cultural layer, and it is quite possible that the ancient people of Akaim played an essential role in the process of forming this image. However, the spirit of the first horse riders is driving our team further away onto the ways paved by the ancient horsemen, towards places where for thousands of years the caravan tracks crossed. Local scientists and horse experts are already expecting us. 
The city of Chlabinsk was once located on the crossroads of trading routes. Exactly for this reason, Chlabinsk's coat of arms depicts a camel. It is also the main decoration of the local pedestrian street. However, before becoming the pedestrian street, this same road once was the horseway. The main question that concerns scientists now and us, of course, is whether the first arcane people reached this place on horseback or in chariots. And thus, what is the proper way of calling them horsemen or chariot drivers? Anthropologists did multiple studies to investigate this matter. For example, it is known that horseback riding results in certain bone deformations. Do you mean that these changes take place in the course of somebody's life? Yes, exactly. So, if analyzing cultures which, as we know, had developed horseback riding, the Turkic nomads, for example, or the ancient Russian combatants. Their leg bones were skewed. A little bit. Visually, it is almost non-visible, but enough for a professional anthropologist to notice. So yes, the Archaim guys have such traces. However, during the osteology and anthropology research of the Bronze Age population in the Volga Ural region, no bone deformations had been revealed. It means that they did not spend long hours on horseback back then. Perhaps more often horses were harnessed in carts or chariots. It was the step world that allowed to realize this potential and put together a high-speed cart and a horse that could go with a speed impossible for other animals. But what were the advantages of a chariot, I mean in direct combat? Well, the chariot had huge advantages, and it was a true revolution which is difficult to appreciate for modern people. With the invention of the chariot, for the first time in human history, soldiers received an enormous advantage. As opposed to earlier steppe soldiers, they became inaccessible. The steppe people created a combat platform that could move very quickly. In this sense, the chariot also gained the status of an elite vehicle, an accessory demonstrating that its rider belonged to upper social class. So the vehicle in this case, the chariot itself, was not as significant as it being combined with a horse. Right you are. What was there the chariots and the horses value at that time? What were the ancient people ready to pay for a horse? Half a kingdom for a horse, as we read in historical novels. Of course, everything has some value. And at that time, one may say it represented one of the highest material values. However, on some points, our Chelyabinsk horse experts Alexei and Yana Voronovs disagreed with Ivan Semyan. I personally disagree with this point of view. As to me, it is absolutely not possible to ride a horse without previously mastering horseback riding and managing the horse without any additional movable equipment. Alexei thinks that man had learned riding horses and that stimulated the evolution of horse harnessing. The process gave rise to proto-bridles and subsequently to the invention of horse-driven vehicles. To prove his point, Alexei refers to the example of North American Indians who did not have wheel for a long time and used dragging harrows up to the 19th century. When they saw the horse and what it was capable of, it might be that they saw how conquistadors rode them. They started catching wild mustangs and using them as transportation, without any saddles or harnessing. They would jump on top of it, holding the mane and rode without any additional devices. So a humanist tried a horse as a natural process. Yes. Could you show us some ancient brittle? What did it look like? By all means, its main difference from the modern one is that it didn't have any metal fastenings initially, so everything was attached to each other using strings and belts. Here they would attach the psallium or the cheek piece. Now we have the snaffle bit or the so-called iron head piece. It's more durable and could serve the ride longer. In the course of subsequent evolution, the further development of bronze made it possible to invent the so-called snaffle bit. Initially, it consisted of two wire-like metal details that were connected with each other in a S-shaped manner. Later, people learned to solder these pieces together. Further on, mouthpieces and more complicated hand harnessing appeared. They would use them both in Asia and in Europe. 
we can say that further upgrading was taking place. Some time later, the modern harnessing buckles and latch hooks as we know them today, like the one that we see here, started to appear. So would it be fair to say that horse harnessing has undergone significant evolution over these thousands of years? Not only the harnessing, but the horse itself. It was also subject to evolution and advanced with time. The horse? Why not? Various new breeds emerged. Horses grew in size. Many other changes took place. My wife, Jana Voronova, will tell you more about it if you want. Initially, wild horses were smaller in size. Due to constant deficit of food, horses didn't grow big and remained very small. When the horse met the man and the latter started using it as a means of transportation, the horse started to move more. With increasing speed and overall amount of movement that the horse was forced to do, it needed more fodder. To recap, interacting with man, horse significantly changed. It grew larger, its scapular bones became stronger and the hoofs also increased in size. What is the name of this guy here? His name is Duke. Nice to meet you, Duke. My pleasure. I'm Arman. What is the difference between Duke and that first tamed horse? Appearance-wise, his neck length is different. His neck is longer? Yes. This is because Duke is a Russian trotter that was bred specifically for draft collar harnessing. This horse and all its ancestors wore the draft collar and thus their neck became more developed. Do you see this crest here? It's muscles that developed as the result of wearing a draft collar. So it appears Duke has significantly mutated in comparison to its ancient predecessors. What breeds are the closest to the ancient steppe horses? I mean not tamed, wild horses. Since we are in the Urals region, I guess the closest one would be the Bashkirian breed. What are the unique characteristics then of this Bashkirian breed physiologically, so to speak? The most important characteristic of the Bashkirian horse breed is its endurance. Compared to race horses, it is easier to maintain it and it can withstand rough conditions. The Bashkirian horse falls within the large group of steppe breeds which are very similar among themselves across the whole territory of the Great Steppe. Steppe horses are sturdy and highly tolerant. They have very firm hooves which don't need horseshoes and feel themselves okay on any type of soil, including stony soils. Jana, what do you personally think about the role of the horse in human life? What was its influence on us? Of course, humans should be grateful to horses because they literally brought us from the ancient times to the present. The horse fostered our development, it helped people to conquer, feed our families, build roads and develop cities. At present, they lost their central role, but I heard that in your country, in Kazakhstan, there are still some very interesting traditions. Your attitude towards horses is not like towards towards food. Food also, but I know that you still see this animal as your satellite, as an integral element of your national history and pride. I'm sure that you are not proud of your horses because you can get a lot of meat from them, but due to the fact that it is a part of your national culture. I know that sports or games with horses are still played in Kazakhstan. Thank you very much for the kind words. We wish all the best to Russian horse breeding as well. Thank you. Goodbye. See you soon. Having learned that a filming crew from Kazakhstan is working in the city, the local Bashkirian diaspora has invited us to come over. Raul Yamaleddinov, one of Chelabinsk Aksakals, was among the people that greeted the expedition. For many years, he has been studying the Bashkirian epic of Ural Bater. An interesting fact about it is that the moment of horse domestication is reflected in this ancient monument of Turkic literature. How big is this epic? How many lines does it contain? Its Bashkirian version consists of 4,560 lines. Are there people who can recite it from memory? In fact, there are. Do you know Rosalia Sultan Galeeva? She probably knows all of it by heart and can also sing it beautifully. But there are also men. Indeed, there are a couple more and they can sing it really well. Vyacheslav Kotov, an archaeologist from the city of Ufa, specializes on the Paleolithic or Rolled Stone Age. He investigated the ancient caves of Bashkortostan, compared the images he found in those caves with the plot lines of the Bashkirian folklore and determined that the Ural Batir epic had been created during the Stone Age, that is, more than 20,000 years ago. 
What other plots are there in this epic proving its ancient origins? Could you show us these sections? In a dry place, they say there lived an old man, Yan Beda, with his old wife, Yan Bika. No possessions, they say they had and didn't collect. No houseware, not even a cauldron they had hanging over the fire. What does it all mean? It means they were still eating raw food and were primitive people. Agree? They didn't use fire to cook their food. No, they didn't know fire back then. Let's go back to the place where it tells how Ural Batir tamed the horse. According to the epic, two brothers became at odds with each other. Shulgan took the evil side and Ural, as they say, became the advocate of good. At some point, brothers tried to marry a beauty called Humai. Humai put forward a condition before brothers. The one who manages to throw a big stone and settles Akubuzat will become her husband. Shulgan failed it and was dishonored before the people. Ural threw the stone without any effort and then... And Buzat came up to him bowing his head. I am yours, Batir, the horse said, and stood on its knees before Ural. So the horse voluntarily obeyed the human. Then the wedding celebrations started lifting Ural, the main character of the epic, to an absolutely new level, the level of gods. So the moment of horse domestication is described as something of a divine nature, right? Exactly. Marrying the mother goddess. Well, she was the daughter of the sun and the daughter of the king of birds. In the epic, Humai herself is described as a deity. And what happens after he settles Akubuzat? Then they went to wage a war on all those Ashdaks, Divas and Diyas. Only working with a horse, the epic's hero gets its mighty force to perform tremendous feats. Where Ural passes with his Akubuzat over his was, dry land appears. Where Ural with his horse breaks apart huge bodies of dragons or Rashdakas, mountains appear. So the epic basically tells us how Ural with his horse Akubuzat brings order to the earth. The epic hero literally destroys the eternal chaos and only with the help of his horse. Yes, justice and good came to our land. But this is not the end of the epic yet. Its main character Ural Batir dies and its faithful horse Akubuzat goes away. However, he suddenly comes back to people and not alone. Akubuzat brings together with him a lot of horses. He collected them somewhere and brought to the same place. What does it mean? It means that horse domestication was a thorough and completed process. Why did this epic emerge at the moment of saddling the horse, when men already rides the horse and horse-driven chariots? Why did they start poeticizing? Well, as we all know, the steppe people are the people of the horses, the horse tamers. It all revolves around horses, horses and people. Those people were born horseback, lived and fought horseback and died on horseback. The horse was the closest friend and companion for them. It meant a whole lot for them. Their souls were rejoicing seeing and living with the horse. I guess at that time they were detaching from land and started to improvise writing such epics, myths, kubayas, acts and tragedies. I guess some creative personalities started to emerge among them. They say there stood Akbozat, never knowing the brittle before, ears straight up like reed, and the mane as a maiden's braid, falcon-like chest, narrow sides, sharp and light on the hoofs, teeth same as garlicky cloves, and the neck thin as snake. Eagle glance has the horse, mighty twirl, hollow cheeks, wolfish predator's eyes, moist eyelids covering them, rushing off like a bird, leaving only the dust clouds behind.
Listening to the text of the ancient epic, the thoughts of the true greatness of the feats by our ancestors come to mind. The ancient steppe people who have discovered the horse tracks a long time ago. They were able to subordinate a strong, beautiful and faithful animal. They created an effective and advanced military transportation technology, the chariots. They spread their influence across the world, including by military order, eventually singing about the joyful merger with the horse, they immortalized their deeds and created a new literary genre of epic. All these achievements and inventions indeed changed the face of this world, and the words by Axakal Victor Zyberg become clear. The connection of the man and the horse became a truly magic, sacral and divine moment in our history. Mind you that this divine miracle took place on our land and was done with the hands of our ancestors. Horseback riding is a nice exercise. Let us be grateful to our ancestors for taming and settling the horse.